Hello. Welcome to Rise and Bust. In today's episode, we will see another rise and bust story. We will analyze how it rose to glitter success, and then we will understand the mistakes that led to its downfall. And just to let you know, we post well-analyzed and real rise and fall stories. Stories of companies and people that once ruled the world, but then busted for small mistakes or series of mistakes. If you are interested in similar stories, then do not forget to hit the subscribe button. Now relax and enjoy the story and let us know in the comments what you learned today. If you have ever heard of the name Xerox, it was probably when someone was referring to a photocopy since it is the field for which the company is most known. Many people don't know that their commercial computer Xerox Alto was created in 1973, before Apple and even before IBM. Along with their many other notable contributions, Xerox deserves the title of one of the most important tech companies of the 20th century. Let's uncover together its untold story, from its emergence as a revolutionary leader in photocopying technology to its downfall in the early 2000s. To explain Xerox's journey better, I will give you a metaphor. Right now, Volkswagen has a facility full of engineers who have created a flying automobile that can go 300 miles per hour, uses water instead of gasoline, and has a system that can massage your shoulders while driving it. And then, picture them doing nothing about it. Imagine they're just sitting on the next generation of transportation while working on how to extend the lifespan of gasoline-powered automobiles by another 10 years. Then, one day, they willfully display their flying prototype to another car company. This is precisely what happened with Xerox. The only difference is we aren't talking about a flying car. Chapter 1. The Beginning of Xerox. Looking back 109 years ago, we will find out that Xerox has a much longer history than any other tech company, mainly because they weren't initially founded as one. Xerox was founded in 1906 in Rochester, New York, as a maker of photographic paper and similar tools. Originally known as the Haloid Photographic Company, they accomplished nothing particularly outstanding for the first 30 years. They were a tiny business and remained that way until 1938. Using an electrically charged drum and toner, Chester Carlson, an American physicist, developed an invention that could successfully print images. A CEO of Xerox, Joseph R. F. Wilson, got very interested in this concept. Over the following years, Chester would resist Joseph's attempts to convince him to market his device. In 1946, Chester finally agreed to commercialize his product. To this day, he is recognized as one of the company's co-founders. First, they came up with the name. They primarily settled on the word xerography, which is Greek for dry writing. After the Haloid company made xerography public at the Optical Society of America on October 22, 1948, the company saw enough interest for them to register the name Xerox as a trademark. Chapter 2. The Rise and Success of Xerox. Just a year after sticking to the name Xerox, the company would release the Model A the first xerographic copier in history. However, this copier was quite far from ideal. With several procedures involved in making a single duplicate, it also required expertise to operate the machine effectively. Xerox persisted in making improvements, and after another 10 years, they would produce the Xerox 914, the first automatic plain paper commercial copier ever made. In an attempt to promote their copier, a famous, iconic commercial came through, showing how simple it was to photocopy a page from a book. Today, this might seem typical for an office worker, but in 1959, this was a true revolution. Essential documents could finally be photocopied, greatly easing the strain of record keeping. Knowing what they had created, the company's vision was strong. Xerox's main focus wasn't actually set on selling the 914 itself. They instead favored a rental system in which users would be charged for each photocopy. Its users would have to pay $25 per month to access the copier and 10 additional cents per copy. The US government was the only party that refused to rent the 914. They intended to acquire 914s altogether, and the two settled on an agreement. They were going to pay $27,500, which is a whopping $281,000 per machine in modern currency. 
Its high price didn't stop it from becoming very popular due to its functionality and usefulness. After only two years, Xerox would generate $60 million in revenue. The company would soon step up its marketing and create an advertisement demonstrating that even a chimpanzee could use its products. Near that time, it would also be listed on the New York Stock Exchange, which increased the company's publicity even more. They generated more than $500 million in sales by 1965, equivalent to $4.7 billion today. Following the 914, Xerox would release additional variants, including the 813, the 420, the 720, the 330, and 2400. These were all slightly distinct from one another and served somewhat different purposes. They were all striving and succeeding at the same thing, making it cheaper and easier to reproduce documents. Before its CEO Joseph Wilson passed away in 1971, he managed one final undertaking known as PARC or the Palo Alto Research Center. PARC was established by Xerox as a second research center in California, near Stanford University. This provided PARC with the advantage of attracting top-notch scientists from all the advanced research centers across the West Coast. Many crazy never-seen-before innovations, such as the Ethernet, computers, laptops, the mouse, file servers, laser printers, and who knows what else, would originate from this research center. You might be wondering, what is the Ethernet? Well, its name sort of gives it away. A team from this research center, Xerox PARC, invented the Ethernet in 1973. The group worked to develop a technique that could link numerous computers far apart. It is noted that the early experimental version of the Ethernet ran at 2.94 megabits per second. The roots of the Internet, as we know it today, lay here. Park strived towards a future where technology would recede into the background of our lives, and people would use devices to access resources and control environments seamlessly. They developed some of the earliest functional examples of the pads and tabs that flood today's computing scene. Chapter 3. The Downfall of Xerox. It appeared like Xerox had big plans to pivot to the PC industry. They possessed all the resources, cash, knowledge, and technology. So, all they had to do was pivot and put money in, but this pivot would never actually come. Instead, Xerox just pushed all of its inventions under the rug and focused on its photocopiers. At first, this worked out fine. Xerox was expanding internationally, becoming a household name even in developing countries. For Xerox, it probably seemed like nothing could ever go wrong, given that they had cornered such an important market. But, as we now know, that was simply not the case. Looking back, there was no pivotal moment that screwed over Xerox. Instead, it was just decades of complacency and ignorance. Outsiders understood Xerox's potential even better than Xerox themselves. I think the best example is this story with Steve Jobs. In 1979, Steve agreed to give Xerox somewhere between 5 to 8 percent of Apple in return for $1 million. However, the condition for this investment was that Steve would get access and be heavily inspired by Xerox's Palo Alto Research Center. And, you guessed it right. Steve would borrow many concepts from Park and, with their help, later launched the Macintosh computer, considered the first commercially successful GUI and mouse-equipped PC. You can't even blame Steve for copying, given that Xerox opened the doors for him. Steve would later state in an interview, they just had no idea what they had. We could also say the same thing about the Apple stake that they received. Their stake would be worth $150 billion today. Xerox could have at least waited for Apple's IPO to sell the stake. But instead, they would end up flipping the stake for only $1.2 million. It seems like Xerox honestly had no idea what they were doing. They could not find a strategy to commercialize all these innovations at Park. Their success was so high within the photocopying industry that they didn't even care that they were squandering such massive opportunities. Eventually, Xerox tried to take a step into the computer industry, but their attempt didn't succeed. In 1981, they launched the Xerox Star, and it pretty much all went downhill from there. Much like the Alto, the Star was created without having direct knowledge of the market's demands or its level of competition. 
Additionally, Xerox did not make much effort to link the system with its manufacturing or marketing capabilities. I mean, the computer worked just fine. It had a friendly user interface, respectable hardware, and productive software. But there was also one more major shortfall, it was unbelievably costly, $16,000. Given that people could get a comparable machine from IBM for less than $1,600, it shouldn't come off as a surprise to hear that the Xerox star flopped. The company didn't even try to salvage the situation. To make matters worse, they ultimately decided to enter the insurance and financial services industry, which is totally different from what they initially focused on. Consequently, their vision became muddled. Companies require frameworks, tools, and processes that help them transform their inventions from concepts to commercial success in order to innovate successfully. Xerox lacked in this. Despite having a wealth of technological expertise, they could not leverage that expertise to adjust to the changes the years brought. The once innovative business became stale. So, it shouldn't be a massive surprise that the company gradually lost billions of dollars and eventually failed. But it isn't all so dark. In 2002, Xerox spun off Park as a separate, wholly owned corporation, and the company has undergone a total reinvention since then. It is currently leading the way in innovation and long-term profitability. Fantastic software and hardware advancements employed by big businesses, startups, and the government have been created by it. The money it makes from licensing its unique intellectual property is a crucial component of its business strategy. An article in the Harvard Business Review claims that Park's success is founded on close customer partnerships, excellent teamwork between internal and external partners, and excellent communication methods necessary for organizing work within the firm. Chapter 4 Lessons learned from the rise and downfall of Xerox Xerox is a company full of technologically advanced products that were designed ahead of its time but whose leaders, unfortunately, weren't promising marketing entrepreneurs. Hypothetically speaking, Steve Jobs could have been hired by Xerox because they definitely had the chance. However, they were a tech corporation that paid tech salaries. They could not recruit the kind of leaders needed to advance because they did not recognize the value of paying entrepreneurial salaries. Despite how it all turned out, we must remember how much of our modern technologies are attributable to Xerox. Because of its vast technological advancements, its story still resonates with business leaders today. Many people say that they can't blame the company for its decisions. Most companies are very uncomfortable and unequipped when it comes to extensive and accurate visions. They generally prefer to take risks where they think they are low and their field of knowledge is more robust. And this was the case with Xerox too. They were making tons of money, their copy volumes kept climbing, and while controlling the high end of its market, all they were trying to do was manage their money. This company showed us how important it is to be innovative, and its demise encourages us always to exert our utmost effort to realize our fullest potential. Xerox didn't use its incredible technology for expansion even though it created it. While it had the opportunity to invest in something much better, it chose to stick with creating copiers, having but not taking the chance to rise to the top of the technological world.